Okay, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, um, quiet our hearts. Um, help us to, uh, during this time together, to focus on you, to focus on your word, um, the warnings uh, that uh, your son gave uh, that we have written down in the pages of scripture uh, for what is coming in the future. Um, we pray that uh, while some of the subjects and things we'll be talking about are dark uh, as it relates to what is coming upon the earth, um, we pray that we would always keep our focus on you because you are light and your son Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And we, we look with anticipation uh, and excitement at his return, and we believe that, that uh, he will be coming back very soon, um, where he will take his place, his rightful place, as king of the earth, and will rule and reign for a thousand years. We are so looking forward to that time when righteousness will prevail in the earth and there will be peace in our planet. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for these dear friends. We thank you that they can uh, take time out of their busy schedules this time of year to be here. And I pray that you would speak through me um, and that you would give me the words that you would once said. We thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The subject that I have uh, decided to teach on this morning, um, I've entitled a deal with the devil in the last days. And I'm sure that in your lives, at times, you've heard people say, oh, that was a deal with the devil, or so-and-so made a deal with the devil. Um, and we kind of say it maybe a little bit callously and, and um, a little tongue-in-cheek, but I assure you that the reason that I named it this is because it is a very serious matter. There is a deal or a covenant, which is really a better term biblically, that is coming upon the earth. Specifically, a covenant that will be entered into in Israel. Between Israel and a satanic entity, the progeny of Satan, the Antichrist. And I want us to, I want us to dig in deeply into this subject today. Um, because I believe that it is so significant and the consequences, the repercussions, the impact of this deal or this covenant is going to completely and utterly devastate Israel and completely and utterly transform the world and pave the way for Christ's second coming. But there are things taking place in our world today that are leading us to this epic event, that are moving us in a crescendoed fashion towards the events of the last days, and in particular, a covenant that is coming that will be made. So I want to focus your attention on the Mosaic Covenant, specifically for the time for the next few minutes, and the reestablishment of animal sacrifices on the Temple Mount. So that's kind of where we're going um, in the immediate context: the Mosaic Covenant and the reestablishment of animal sacrifices on the Temple Mount. Now, how do we relate that to what's going on today? There have been recent elections in Israel. And I want to reiterate to you that it's so important that we don't look at current events and then from those current events extrapolate and come up with an end times theology. In contrary fashion, we study the scriptures. We look at what, what does God have to say, what does his word have to say about end time events. And based on our understanding of what God's word says, we look at current events and from those current events, it's, is it possible, we ask ourselves the question, is it possible that we are moving ever closer to the events as described in Scripture? Can we look at current events today and say, yes, we are moving ever closer to what will be taking place and transpiring based on biblical texts? And I would suggest to you that, that is exactly what we are seeing. And there are any number of areas that we can look to and make the case for that. But in particular, I want to focus your attention on Israel 
and even more specifically, I want to focus you on Jerusalem, and then even more specifically, I want to focus you on the Temple Mount, and then even more specifically, I want to focus you on the current Israeli elections, or the elections that just took place. And that is that Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who had been the former Prime Minister of Israel for many years, has just been re-elected. Now, why is that significant? Because in Israel, you must form a coalition with other parties. It's a very unique, entangled, difficult system to operate in. It is, it is flawed. If you think our system is flawed here in America, you ought to take a look at Israel's system uh, and the, the various parties and the coalitions and the backdoor deals. Uh, it is amazing to, to behold. Benjamin Netanyahu, in order to actually become the official prime minister, has to form a coalition. He has to have enough seats in parliament in order to do that. He had, once his election took place, he had a, a period of time in which he needed to form this coalition to have enough seats. He brought in coalition partners, and where he is reaching to is to his right. And to his right are orthodox parties, religious parties, nationalistic parties. He's not reaching to the left. He has to reach to the right to bring enough partners into his coalition in order to form a seated coalition in parliament so he can become prime minister. Now, he ran out of time in terms of the deadline, and he's able to apply, he was able to apply for an extension legally within the Israeli system, and he did that. And we are just about, right now, four to five days away from the end of the extension that he applied for, where he has to either seat a coalition or the opportunity to be the prime minister may go to someone else, if you can believe, even though he was elected. He is very close to bringing in enough coalition partners to become prime minister. But he's had to reach so far to the right that what he's needed to do is he needed to create additional non-existing cabinet positions and give them to individuals within these parties to the right in order to keep the parties happy in order to bring them into his coalition. So he keeps reaching further and further to the right in order to do so. Otherwise, he can't rule as prime minister. Now, why is that important? Because the groups that he is bringing in are to the right. They are religious, orthodox Jews, nationalistic Jews, and those who are very focused on issues on the right. Now, as Many of you are Bible-believing Christians and who are watching this are Bible-believing Christians. When we hear right, we tend to think that's a good thing. And in many respects, it is a good thing. And in Israel, in many respects, it is a good thing because they are more for moral principles and, and things that we would concur with. However, on Israel's right, they have groups and, co and these parties that are looking to reestablish Orthodox Judaism in a very powerful and dynamic way within Israel and within Israeli society. Do you know that if you're in Israel today, uh, as we travel many times over there, and it's the Sabbath, and you're in a hotel, and you walk into the elevator from the lobby of the hotel, if it is the Sabbath, you usually there's two elevators. One is the Sabbath or the Shabbat elevator, and one is the elevator for the Gentiles. Okay, so people who go in there, if it's on the Sabbath, believe me, you don't want to get on the Shabbat elevator on the Sabbath. You know why? Because it's pre-programmed to stop at every floor. Open the door, wait a minute, close the door. If you're in a 20-story hotel, you're going to be in that elevator a very long time. You know why? Because Orthodox Jews believe that it is wrong or sin to push the button on the elevator on the Sabbath. So, and I'll jump a little ahead and then come back. When Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, when the disciples ask him a question, and we may get to this later in, this, uh, in the teaching today, when, when the disciples ask him, uh, what shall be the sign of your coming the end of the age? And Jesus is talking about things that are coming and the difficulties that will be arising for Jewish people in Jerusalem. What does he say? Pray that your flight, your departure, your fleeing away from the Antichrist and what's happening, pray that it's not on the Sabbath because there's limitations to how far you can travel on the Sabbath. If, if there's no tr public transportation on the Sabbath, if you can't push a button on an elevator, imagine the difficulties in traveling and getting away, okay, and having to flee. So you have these groups on the right 
who are very, very strict in many re regards in terms of Orthodox Judaism, and they want to impose this in education. They want their own Orthodox communities to only teach Judaism and the Torah to their communities of young people. So you're going to have potentially, if this coalition um, comes and finalizes, you're going to have g different varying groups that are going to say, educationally, we're going to teach this, we're going to teach rabbinical Judaism, we're going to teach Orthodox Judaism, and then the rest of the country is going to be teaching something else. Essentially what is happening in Israel is you have a move, believe it or not, even amidst young people, moving to the right in the military and in other places, which means the country is by and large, even though there's a large loud faction of liberals who are, are existing in Israel or seculars who are living in Israel who are very vociferous and hate what's happening, there is a growing body of people within the citizenry of Israel that are becoming more conservative and they are looking to impose religious laws on the rest of the country. Now, they talk about for instance, the, uh, is there going to be a one or a two-state solution in Israel? Are you going to have two states, the Palestinian West Bank, and is that going to become its own nation and Israel proper becoming its own nation? Or are you going to be able to allow settlements, to Israeli settlements, to be built in what's known as the West Bank or the Israeli occupied territories is what the world calls it? Um, are you going to have a, 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 a divided education system? All of these things are significant in terms of what's taking place in Israel. And the move is towards putting people into positions of power who are going to force this upon the rest of the nation. So you have a lot of secular people and, believe it or not, even Christians in Israel who are very concerned because even though it's religious, if you're pushing an Orthodox Judaism and kosher laws and the Mosaic law and everything else on the rest of the nation, it becomes very restrictive for those who are not Orthodox Jews, who do not subscribe to that system. So why is all this important? Because the main issue, the number one issue, you can talk about the West Bank, you can talk about education, you can talk about whether young Orthodox Jewish men should have to be uh, forced to serve in the Israeli military. You can talk about all those things. But the number one issue, ladies and gentlemen, is this. The number one issue is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. What you are looking at is the most important and consequential piece of real estate on planet Earth. Approximately 33 to 35 acres. This is the place where Israel's temple once stood. And for many of you, you may not have ever seen it like this from an, from the, an aerial view. This is basically a rectangular mount area, platform, if you will. This was the hill or mountain, if you can believe, before the structure was here in ancient times, where Abraham came to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to God. This is the place, the mountain of Moriah. Now, there were temples that Israel had constructed, but they were smaller and less grandiose until Herod the Great came just before the time of Jesus. And Herod the Great wanted to enlarge and beautify and make more impressive the temple that was there. And he really essentially reconstructed one that was there. But in order to make the whole expanse more grand, he built a platform around the mountain and he filled it in and raised the level. So what you have today is the Temple Mount area, and the walls that you see here around this Temple Mount are not the original walls. Some of them are original to the time of Herod, and you can tell because they have a beveled edge around them, and they're very impressive. When you look at the Western Wall, uh, or what you know as the Wailing Wall where Jews pray, you can see the stones that are there, the stones that have a beveled edge carved into them. They're original to the time of Herod the Great. Massive, massive stones. And a lot of the wall that you see, is the Wailing Wall, is actually underground. Because as conquering armies would come in, the level of the city continued to rise. As they destroyed and rebuilt, the level of the city continues to rise. So what you see today is the Wailing Wall. A third of that wall is still underground because the rubble was pushed up against it. A very impressive structure. However, a lot of the smaller stones that you see around this platform 
came at the time of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. When the Ottoman Turks from 1517 to 1917 were in Jerusalem, they reconstructed the walls and built that area. So why is this platform, why is the Temple Mount so important to Jews? Because it's the place where their temple once stood. What you see there today is the Dome of the Rock, an Islamic shrine, it's not a mosque, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is also an Islamic mosque, okay? So you have those two structures that are on there. They were built in the 7th century AD and about the 8th century AD, okay? So 700, 600, 700 AD, okay? They came much, much later. Why did Jews want to get back to the Temple Mount? Why is it so important to them? All of these factions from the right within Israel, from their political parties, why do they care about this? They care about this because the temple was there and the Mosaic law. You see, we don't think too much about those issues because as believers, as I trust most of you, if not all of you are, we focus on what Jesus did on the cross for us. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, a once and for all sacrifice by God for us on our behalf. But you see, for Jews, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that he was God's son and that he was sent by God to die on the cross for their sin. So if you are a practicing Jew today, how do you find acceptance before holy God? You see, because the temple was done away with and there's no more animal sacrificial system, the rabbis and the religious scholars within Israel through the, through the centuries said, well, mitzvahs. You know what a mitzvah is? Good deeds. Do good deeds. But thinking and true to the text, Orthodox Jews understand that the Bible said specifically in the Old Testament, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So where is the blood sacrifice? When I talk to Orthodox Jewish people when I'm in Israel, I ask them the question, what do you do to find acceptability before a holy God who is a consuming fire? What do you do about your sin issue? We've all sinned. What do you do about it? Mitzvahs and good deeds? Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness. So where's your blood atonement? And they struggle because they have no temple and they have no animal sacrificial system. It was done away with. So thinking True to the text, Orthodox Jews say we want to get back to animal sacrifice. We want to get back to the temple where our, the, the temple mount, where our temple once stood, and we want to reestablish a sacrificial system to atone for our sin. Do you know that there are many groups within Israel today that every Passover, there's, there's a conflict somewhere in the old city of Jerusalem and near the Temple Mount, not on it yet, to sacrifice animals on their behalf for their sin. Every Passover. And these groups are getting louder and louder and making more of a statement. And there are more and more people within Israel saying, you know what? How come as Israelis, we don't have sovereignty over this spot in the center of Jerusalem? Jordan has control over it, and the Muslims have control over it. And the Jews say, why don't we have sovereign control of this, this spot right in the center of Jerusalem, our most holy place where our temple stood? More and more Jews are coming to the realization and saying, we want to reestablish our temple or tabernacle structure there, and we want to reestablish animal sacrifice. Now, there are some Jews within the Orthodox camp who say, no, we can't go up there at all because... We don't know where the temple exactly stood and we could step into the, whole, the area where the Holy of Holies was, which would be a sacrilege to them and an abomination to God. So there are some who say, no, don't, don't do that. But, they're, but they would love to see a new tab tabernacle or temple structure and the reinstitution of animal sacrifice. So is there anywhere in the Bible that speaks to this? I mean, you're living in this time right now First of all, some of you were born before Israel even became a modern nation. Think about what is happening in your lifetime or close to your lifetime in recent memory. 
Israel is back as a modern nation back in the land after almost 2,000 years of being spread across the face of the earth. God is bringing them back. And the reinstitution of the animal sacrificial system. So where do we find that in the Bible in connection to the last days? Is there a place? And absolutely, yes, there is. Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. What does the text say? And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What it really means is, shall be poured upon the desolator, that individual who desolates or desecrates the temple. So, he, I believe this is speaking about the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So now the question is, okay, there's going to be some type of a covenant, and it's going to be for one week, a period of seven years. And in the midst of the week or the middle of the week, he, the Antichrist, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Ah, there's the sacrifice and the oblation. Is there currently sacrifices going on on a national level from Jerusalem at the Temple Mount with a temple or tabernacle structure? No, there is not. So the text clearly says when the Antichrist is on the scene, when this one who will come, he will confirm a covenant with, what's it say? With many, with many. And the context is within Israel. So the Antichrist will come. He will confirm a covenant with many within Israel. Does it say all? With many within Israel for one week and based on Daniel's prophecy, and I won't get into all the details of it right now, there's a prophecy of 490 total years that God gave to, to Daniel. 483 of those years of the prophecy took us to the crucifixion of Jesus. Now there is a gap in time. We are living in that gap of time right now, and it's called the times of the Gentiles. But there is a seven-year period of time that is still hanging out there in the future, which will, when it finishes, will complete the 490-year prophecy that God gave to Daniel in the Old Testament. So this seven-year period of time, one week, a period of a week, is still hanging out there. So the question is, when we're looking at Daniel's 70th week, we're looking at this final seven years of the full 490-year prophecy. Again, this seven years is still in the future. But we want to look specifically at what the text just said, because remember, we're seeing the rise of groups within Israel and a push to want to get back on the Temple Mount to start the animal sacrificial system. So, this final seven years, what is going to precipitate it? What is going to be the, the, um, the instigator, um, the catalyst for this to start? We're told that the Antichrist confirms the covenant with the many within Israel for a week, a period of seven years. But the text continues, and it says that he will break the covenant at the midpoint, in the middle of the seven years. Okay? So you have the Antichrist signing a covenant with many here at the beginning, and then at the midpoint, the Antichrist breaks the covenant, and what does the text tell us? He causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, which means there is a sacrifice and oblation that is taking place, we know, during this period of time because the Antichrist breaks his covenant and he ends animal sacrifices. So now here's the question, folks. This is the question. And I, and I, I want to, I wrestle with this and I continue to wrestle with it and I'm just being very open with you about the, the potential or possibilities for the type of covenant this is. So I want to, to kind of talk that through with you. What type of covenant will be confirmed? Okay? What type of covenant? And I just want to go back to this just for a moment. The assumption on the, based on the text, and this is, this is one of just a, a, a few texts that we have to go on to get a sense 
of what this covenant will be like. What type of covenant is it? And this is crucial for us to understand. The assumption based on the text we just read is the Antichrist confirms a covenant of some sort with many within Israel for a period of seven years. And at the midpoint, he breaks the covenant and the text goes on to say that he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So the inference is that, well, then what he, what he signed with them at the beginning or what was confirmed at the beginning must have had something to do with animal, the reinstitution or the reestablishment of Israel's animal sacrificial system. I mean, that's kind of the inference because it doesn't say what kind of a covenant it is that was confirmed. It is says when he breaks it, he'll stop animal sacrifice. So Christians worldwide, and myself included, have just assumed that the covenant that's made, that's confirmed, must have something to do with reinstituting animal sacrifice. And therefore, if you have animal sacrifice, you must have a temple or minimally some type of a tabernacle or a tent-like structure that would be associated with it. So the assumption that we've made within Christianity who are people who are studying this is that, well, then it must be that somehow as part of the covenant, he allows them to start the sacrifices and some type of a structure, temple or tabernacle structure, is constructed at that point. But we really don't know from the text. And this is important, and I tell you why. Because as difficult as it may be for us when we look at the politics, the geopolitical situation in Israel, and we looked at that picture of the Islamic shrine, the Dome of the Rock, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, it's very difficult for us to comprehend the idea of how anything could change from that status quo until something like this happens, which thro throws it all into a tither. You understand? So it's hard to fathom how the status quo and the situation that is there in Israel today could change. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to suggest to you that it could change before these events transpire. It may not be that when the Antichrist, this one who's coming that's going to be against and in place of the true Christ, he's a deceiver of Israel. He's a false messiah. It may not be that when he comes, the covenant that he's making may be about starting animal sacrifice or building a new temple or a tabernacle structure. It's possible that based on events that are taking place in our lifetimes, it's possible that there may be a way for Israel to work out a deal prior or separate from this with other Arab nations. For instance, like the United Arab Emirates, who is now in the process of constructing in the UAE, on the Persian Gulf, in an Islamic country, a multi-building complex that's going to have a church, a mosque, and a synagogue, all massive in scale as part of a interfa an interfaith group sanctioned by the government. So that's revolutionary to people in terms of the thinking of what's going on right now. So is it possible that what is being rolled out in the United Arab Emirates with a large church, a large synagogue, and a large mosque, and an interfaith concept to foster peace, is it possible that that same type of thing could transpire here in Jerusalem? It could. And is it possible that it could transpire and allow Jewish groups to go up and to initially maybe pray on the Temple Mount as they're asking for? They're not coming out and saying, we want to have animal sacrifice. They're saying, we'd like to get up on the Temple Mount and we'd like to pray. You see how it, it, it moves incrementally. So is it possible that in our lifetime with the things that we're seeing and the movement of the Orthodox Jews in Israel and others of nationalistic thinking within Israel, could they reinstitute the sacrificial system? It's possible that it could, and that it could be going before this even takes place and before the Antichrist is on the scene. Now, let me tell you the reason why I think that's possible, as we talked about what type of covenant will be confirmed. I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 28. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to Isaiah 28. Okay, Isaiah chapter 28. Now, Isaiah, prophet of Israel, in the previous chapters, and we don't have time to go there today, but in the previous chapters, the context of what Isaiah is talking about is end times. Day of the Lord, 
the time of God's wrath, the time of God's judgment, the time when God will bring righteousness to, uh, to a culmination. So the context of what we're looking at right here, because it's important when you jump in, are we looking at a prophecy that happened historically, was fulfilled historically? Or are we looking at a prophecy that was happening in the time that Isaiah was writing, something that was just a current event? Or are we looking at something that is clearly focused on the future and specifically on the coming covenant that the Antichrist, this, this false Messiah, Israel's ultimate nemesis, that he will be foisting upon the people? So look, Isaiah says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. Let me ask you a question. The government that's ruling in Israel, there could be some good people in it. They make, make some good decisions, but are they a divinely appointed king over Israel? Nope. No. They're a secular government. They may have some religious thinking, but they're not a government in, ensconced there by God as a divinely appointed ruler like King David was. So will, do, does Israel's governing uh, party and political leadership, do they make mistakes? Of course they do. Of course, am I supportive of Israel? Yes, but is everything that they do and every decision they make, do I support all of those things? No, they have a human government that is not divinely appointed by God. So here we're talking about in the future, Isaiah has a prophecy. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Now listen, because ye have said, now this is directly to the Jewish leadership, I believe in, in the future, and Isaiah is prophesying, and the nation itself, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death. Wow, is that powerful language. We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Did you get that? That is strong, powerful, condemning language. But did you see what they're saying? Did you see what the Jewish people and Jewish leadership are saying? We made an agreement with hell. And why? Because when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, what's the overflowing scourge? The armies of the world of that area that will be passing through. Folks, this is a connection, I believe, to Ezekiel chapter 38 and an end times invasion from the north. And where will that end times invasion go? The Bible says it will come from the north of Israel. It will come by land, by sea, ships, into Egypt, take over Egypt, Ethiopia to the south of Egypt and Sudan and Libya, the Bible says in other texts, will also be taken over and will be under the authority of the Antichrist. And then the text goes on to say, and the Antichrist will also enter into the beautiful land, Israel. Now, what does Jesus say in Matthew 24? He says, you're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars in this time period. Your nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But don't worry, the end is not yet. You see, there's going to be a time, I believe, and it's tough to wrap our arms around this in one session. There's going to be a time when an individual who will, will rise to power, I believe he will come from Israel's north, based on many texts in scripture. And I believe he will form a coalition of 10 kings or 10 nations that will give their, their power and authority to this one individual who will rule over them, the Antichrist. The Bible is clear about that. And I believe that this individual will form a coalition of 10 kings, 10 nations that are all Islamic. And that these Islamic nations most likely are going to be forming a caliphate, an Islamic theocracy, and they will all join together to form a powerful 10 nation confederation or entity. And these 10 kings, the Bible is clear, will give their power and authority to one individual, the Antichrist, who will rule over them. And then in Ezekiel chapter 38, we're told about this invasion from the north that sweeps into Egypt, that sweeps into other countries. I believe probably Cyprus in the Mediterranean, maybe Greece and the areas of 
uh, Egypt, like I said, Sudan, Ethiopia, Libya, which is clear in the Bible, that these places will be overrun by this powerful individual who will have this end times invasion. So when you read this and you see this in the, in the proper context of this end times invasion from other passages of scripture, you've made, Isaiah says, a covenant with death. You've made a covenant with hell. You're in agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through. And you know, the Bible is clear in Ezekiel 38 and other passages that these armies that are going to be just blowing through the whole region and conquering nations and lands around Israel at first and then eventually Israel, when they do that, they're going to be led by this individual that is going to just flow through the whole area. So when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. So they're saying, ah, because we've made this agreement with hell, with the devil, we've capitulated on our principles, whether there's been payoffs, who knows what the deal involves. But clearly what the text is saying in Isaiah is when that overflowing scourge shall pass through, you're saying, oh, it's not going to impact us. Because why? We have peace and safety. We're, we're dwelling comfortably. We're dwelling confidently because this overflowing scourge isn't going to pass through. We've got a deal. We've got a deal. It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. And what does the text say? Just a few verses later, Isaiah says, And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. Your, your contract is canceled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When, what it, here it is again, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. The text is clear, and this is in an end times passage of scripture in Isaiah as a prophecy where Isaiah is explaining that this covenant that you sign is going to be canceled. And, and do you know what the text tells us in other places? That when these armies swoop in, you know what's happening? God is drawing them. God is calling them. God, listen, God in the last days is going to judge the nations. He's going to judge Israel's historic persecutors. But you know what? He's also going to judge Israel. And throughout Israel's history, God judged them. He, he judged them wanting to move them back into a proper relationship with him. And for a time they were there. And then they slipped away into idolatry. They slipped away into paganism. They turned the, their back on the God that brought them through so many trials and tribulations. And then God punished them. And how did God punish them in many instances? He, brought, he took them into captivity. He brought foreign armies to come in and to do the work. And this is exactly what is being described here in an ultimate sense. When Israel signs a covenant with death and God says, you think you signed it to, to, to protect yourself. You're looking for protection in all the wrong places. You're looking for protection from an approaching series of, of nations and armies under an individual who's going to swoop through and you're seeing it all around you, you think you're safe because you've sold your soul. You should be dependent on me, is what God is saying. And I am drawing because of your idolatry and your turning away from me, Israel. I am bringing these nations in. The Bible says in other places that God is going to put hooks in their jaws and pull them into Israel for his ultimate purposes. So many within Israel will enter into a covenant for, pro for protection it raised or based on falsehood and lies. That's the kind of covenant that it is. Now I want to compare this, it's very important, to Israel's historic apostasy under Antiochus Epiphanes. How many of you know the story of Antiochus Epiphanes? Raise your hand. If you don't, it's okay. 168 BC. A very, very significant historic figure that was a persecutor of Israel and the Jewish people, specifically in the area of Jerusalem. Now, 
when I say apostasy, you say uh, comparison to Israel's historic apostasy under Antiochus Epiphanes. What is, what is an apostasy? An apostasy is simply a falling away or a total abandonment of the God of Israel. That's an apostasy. So when the Bible says <clears throat> they will apostatize, it means there will be a complete and total turning away from the God of the Bible to embrace a false Messiah, if you will. They've completely abandoned the God of their fathers. They've abandoned the God of the Bible, the God of heaven, a total abandonment. Now, <clears throat> I want to read you something that's important. I normally don't like to just read, but this is an excerpt from an article that my father wrote many years ago, and I can't possibly give you all the information that's contained in here in, in the short amount of time that we have. Um, without reading it. So I'm going to do that. I hope you stay with me. You're going to learn a lot if you stay focused on the text and what took place historically. Many Jews during the 70th week will apostatize and they will totally abandon the God of, of uh, their fathers and the messianic hope in favor of a false Messiah, the Antichrist. The future ascendancy of the Antichrist is foreshadowed in the Bible by the past emergence of the Grecian Syrian leader Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes came on the scene after an individual that you'd probably all know, Alexander the Great, okay, from Greece. So, historically, you have the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, okay, and then the Greeks after the Greeks were the Romans. So during the time of the Greeks, Alexander the Great sweeps across much of the Middle East and he conquers a whole wide swath of area and he dies and he dies without an heir. His kingdom is divided into four, ma four major uh, generals that were under, under him because he had no heir. Two in particular were important. One in the area of ancient Assyria to the north of Israel, Antiochus Epiphanes, and another powerful entity to the south in Egypt called the Ptolemies. So there was a constant battle between the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids and Antiochus Epiphanes, the ruler of the Seleucid Empire at this time. There's a constant battle between, and what little nation is caught in the middle? Israel. 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 Okay, so that's the context. So the future ascendancy of the Antichrist is foreshadowed in the Bible by the past emergence of the Grecian Syrian leader Antiochus Epiphanes from this northern area, the Seleucid Empire, after the time of Alexander the Great. So important is this personage in history and prophecy that three major passages of the word of God are given over to his career in Daniel 8, Daniel 11, and Zechariah 9. He is clearly and indisputably set forth in scripture as a type or illustration of the Antichrist. You want to know what the Antichrist is like? Look at Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus sought to defeat surrounding nations through military conquest and then to assimilate them into his kingdom through their adoption of Hellenistic or Greek culture. So he wanted to assimilate them by, by getting them to embrace his Greek, remember, Alexander the Great from the area of Macedonia, Greece, and the whole Greek philosophy, the Greek culture, the Greek gymnasium, the Greek language, the Greek gods, okay? So if you can get conquered peoples to buy into that, then you can move your troops somewhere else. You can put your money somewhere else because the people you conquered, they've bought into your system. So Antiochus sought to defeat the surrounding nations through military conquest, then to assimilate them into his kingdom through their adoption of Greek culture. He believed that if he could get conquered nations to speak the Greek language, wear Greek clothing, adopt Greek philosophy, and above all, worship the Greek gods, he could quickly and effectively assimilate them into his empire. With that accomplished, conquered nations would pay tribute or funds paid to remain at peace with him, serve in his army and be buffers between his empire and the enemy nations and allow his invading troops to be withdrawn from successfully assimilating nations to fight somewhere else. Sounds, sounds reasonable, right? Okay. To achieve that end in 168 BC, while returning to Syria from war in Egypt, the troops of Antiochus Epiphanes marched into Israel. On this occasion, history records that they sought to turn the Jewish people from Moses and the law right? 
from circumcision as an identification of covenantal relationship with Jehovah and from the religious customs. History notes that Antiochus initially met with a great measure of success in converting the Jewish people to Greek culture and gods. A large segment of the apostate, those who had turned or were willing to turn away from God to embrace this false system, a, a large segment of apostate Jews entered into a covenant with Antiochus and willingly capitulated to his demands. An account of that event written shortly after it occurred is recorded in the first book of Maccabees. This is a, not an inspired book of the Bible, but it, all, it is uh, valuable historically, a very valuable historic document. So here's what it says. In those days of Antiochus Epiphanes, lawless men came forth from Israel and misled many, saying, let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles round about us. For since we separated from them, many evils have come upon us. This proposal pleased them. And some of the people eagerly went to the king Antiochus, and he authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. So they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem for Greek education, according to Gentile custom, and removed the marks of circumcision and abandoned the Holy Mosaic Covenant. They joined themselves with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. This falling away or total abandonment of the God of Israel by many of the Jews is specifically called the apostasy. 1 Maccabees continues this way, Then the king's officers who were forcing the apostasy came to the city of Modi'in. This is about uh, 15, 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem. It's a thriving city today. It was a little village back then. They forced the apostasy in the little uh, town of Modi'in to make them offer pagan sacrifices. Specifically, the sacrifice was the killing of a pig as a sacrifice to the heathen deity Zeus, a Greek deity, Zeus Olympus. This was an abomination of great magnitude for observant Jews. Under the Mosaic law, the pig was strictly forbidden and some of the Jews rebelled against this abomination. Others capitulated to it. The many, we talked about the many who capitulate. The ancient historian continues the story of Antiochus and the Jews. Listen to this. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to defile the temple and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane so that they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. This is a perfect description, ladies and gentlemen, of apostasy, a falling away, a turning away, a complete turning from the God of the Bible. This covenant, which many of the Jews entered into with Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC, prefigures the covenant which many from among Israel will enter into with the Antichrist in a soon coming day. The parallels between the historically fulfilled events under Antiochus Epiphanes and the prophetic events awaiting fulfillment under the Antichrist are amazing, the parallels. There can be no question but that in the Olivet Discourse, we're going to get there in a minute, Matthew 24, the Lord himself assumed that his hearers were familiar with the events surrounding Antiochus Epiphanes and Israel's great apostasy. Now, let's look at the parallels quickly between Antiochus historically and the Antichrist prophetically. Here are the parallels. These are just some. Both enter into a covenant to protect Israel. So this historic, this historical individual, Antiochus Epiphanes, and the future Antichrist, both have in common, enter into a covenant to protect Israel. Both make their covenants with many in Israel, with many in Israel. Their support, however, is not unanimous. So when the Bible says a covenant with the many, it means not everyone is going to capitulate into this covenant with many. 
Both break, should be B-R-E-A-K, their covenants. Both break their covenants. Both introduce a false god into the temple. In both instances, some Jews oppose their false religion and perish. In both instances, righteous Jews flee to escape. In both instances, many religious Jews die because they will not violate the Sabbath. Once again, it is clear that the Sabbath laws are in place in Israel when this happens at this time. And folks, I remind you once again that you are seeing a move within Israel and have been for some years to reinstitute the Mosaic law, the Sabbath laws, and this animal sacrificial system in Israel. Eight, in both instances, many women and children will perish. As a matter of fact, horrifically, at the time of Antiochus Epiphanes in history, Women who would continue to teach their children based on the Mosaic law, um, who continued to circumcise their newborn children. History records that during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, women were put on the walls of the city and their babies were hung from their necks. It, is, it was a horrible, despicable period of time of... persecution of murder within Israel's history. Now, why do I tell you all of these things? Because this goes to the issue of what kind of covenant that we're looking at. Remember our chart? And remember that the Antichrist confirms a covenant with many within Israel at the beginning of the seven years that is coming? And that at the midpoint, you have the sacrifice that's already in place will cease. He will cause it to cease when he breaks his covenant of protection of, over Israel. When that overwhelming scourge comes in, remember the, the, the covenant that Israel made, Isaiah prophesied, the covenant that they made with death, saying, ah, oh, we'll be safe when that overwhelming scourge of nations is attacked. We won't be part of it. And God says, no, no, no. Your covenant will be annulled. Your covenant is canceled. The Antichrist and his armies are going to come right into Israel when you least expect it. Now, when Jesus, in Matthew chapter 24, if you have your Bibles, turn there. And I must wrap up here quickly. Very quickly, I just want to set this up for you. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. You have the Kidron Valley, the Mount of Olives on the other side, looking at the grandiose, magnificent temple. Jesus has just excoriated the Jewish religious leadership in the previous scene, telling them that woe unto them, they're, they're hypocritical, they're leading the people astray, the Jewish leadership. And Jesus condemns them in the strongest possible language. And the, the disciples follow Jesus from the Temple Mount area through the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives on the other side. And Jesus Jesus is talking to them and the disciples say to him on the way over there, they say, but, but Jesus, isn't the temple magnificent as if to salvage something from what had just happened where Jesus is excoriating the Jewish leaders in front of everyone publicly? Isn't the temple magnificent? And Jesus says, you see that temple? It's going to be destroyed. And the disciples, not, he says, not one stone will be left upon another. And the disciples are shocked and, and they say to him, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? In other words, you're talking about these epic, you know, mind-boggling things, this magnificent, glorious temple that's here. And Jesus says, it's all going to be destroyed. And they say, well, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus enunciates to them, it's called the Olivet Discourses on the Mount of Olives. He enunciates to them in Matthew chapter 24, he's answering their question, not specifically about when Israel's temple would be destroyed in maybe 40, approximately 40 years from when they're talking in 70 AD. He's not primarily focused on that because their question wasn't just when's the temple going to be destroyed. Their question is what shall be the sign of your coming, your return, and the end of the age? So Jesus' focus is not just primarily on the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, but the ultimate end when he will return 
And so the question is, what's going to happen? And Jesus lays out for them, in the chart that you saw here, he lays out for them different things that will be transpiring during that period of seven years. He's taking what Daniel had already prophesied in his 490-year prophecy of that final seven years that's still to come, the 70th week of Daniel, and Jesus is overlaying it with specifics in Matthew 24 to his disciples. And he says there's going to be false Christs. There's going to be war, famine, pestilence, disease. And then Jesus says all those things, that's just the beginning of sorrows. And ladies and gentlemen, that takes you halfway through that final seven years. All that's just the beginning of sorrows. And now we jump to this text. Matthew 24, 15, and Jesus says, when ye therefore shall see the, what? Abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So when Jesus is using this language in Matthew chapter 24 and the Olivet Discourse to his disciples, and he says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. He's referring to something that the Jews understood perfectly well. They understood that Daniel had referenced it in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel is talking about these things. And then the Jews assuredly understood what was taking place with the abomination of desolation because they understood what happened historically. They understood an, a great apostasy and abomination that had taken place. So now when Jesus is here, he's answering the disciples' question of what's going to happen in the future that parallels what already happened historically. You understand? So he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, what is that? What is the abomination of desolation? When the Antichrist at the middle of the 70th week, when he comes in, when that overflowing scourge that is hit, hitting all the other nations around Israel, when it swoops into Israel itself, it comes into Israel itself. The Antichrist comes into Jerusalem, and what, what are we told? He sets up his headquarters between the greater sea and the lesser sea, the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea. And where is in between? On the glorious holy mountain? Jerusalem. So when that overflowing scourge comes in, what happens? The nations and the armies come in, surprise Israel, because they had a deal. They had a covenant. And this individual who, who confirmed this covenant with them, he abrogated the covenant. He canceled the covenant. He double-crossed them. And he comes in, and what does he do? He sets up his headquarters in Jerusalem. And then what does he do? He puts an image of himself in the temple and demands that the Jews bow down and worship. And he causes all, both small and great, to what? Receive his mark. Receive his mark. And this is the catalyst, ladies and gentlemen, for what the Bible refers to as the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of Israel's trouble. Why? Because they were following up until that point, some within the nation, the Mosaic law and the animal sacrificial system, and they were keeping the Sabbath. And then when he swoop, swoops in at the midpoint, breaking his covenant, and he says, uh-uh, I'm doing away with all that at your temple. Worship me. Worship me. So this is an abomination. And listen, there will be many within Israel who will succumb, who will say, we'll bow down and worship. We will turn, we will apostatize. We will turn completely from the God of our fathers and our ancestors, the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth. We will turn and embrace a false Messiah, an apostasy. That will take place. However, there will be many within Israel, a remnant, who will not bow the knee to the Antichrist. And those individuals will flee Jerusalem. And Jesus in Matthew 24, and you should read it this afternoon, gives them warning 
to say, when you see these things taking place, get out as fast as you can. Don't come down, don't come into your house and gather your stuff and make a nice little suitcase. When you see the armies coming around Jerusalem and you see this abomination, get out as fast as you can. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we're not just talking about Jews. We're talking about those who are living in Israel at that time and the ripple effects will be felt worldwide of Christians. Because it is clear from 2 Thessalonians and many other portions of Scripture and the Lord's words in Matthew 24 that God's wrath has not begun yet. What we are, what we are protected from, what we are told in Scripture, that we are not going to, point to appoint, uh, be appointed unto God's wrath. It is not the wrath of Satan. It is not the wrath of the Antichrist that Christians are going to be spared from. It is the wrath of God that we are spared from. And that wrath does not begin until sometime inside the second half of the 70th week. That's not our focus for today, but I want you to understand. So what we're talking about is an abomination where there's a desecration of the temple that's in Jerusalem. The animal sacrificial system, which I believe is, we're getting very close to seeing it re-implemented. You are living in that period of time. And that abomination will take place. The Antichrist sets up an image. He demands the worship. And he says, take my mark. Many will. Many will. And they are going to destruction. But there is a remnant who will flee and who will not take his mark. Now, very, very quickly, and I know I've gone over, but it's so important. I want you to get this. When this apostasy takes place, and there is a great falling away. And listen, the rip, like I said, the ripple effects of this are felt worldwide. It is centered in Israel, centered in Jerusalem, but the impact will be felt around the world. When the Bible talks about this great apostasy taking place, particularly within Israel, Jesus gives warnings in Matthew 24, and there are warnings in other places that make it clear that it is that this false messiah listen he's not going to show up in a in a devil costume with horns and a pitchfork he's going to be very persuasive very convincing and you know what jesus says so convincing that if it were possible he could deceive even the very elect of god that's how convincing and you know what's going to make him even more convincing false prophets there's going to be false prophets and false Christs, others, and there are today that are claiming to be Christ. But specifically, there's going to be, we're told in Revelation 13, there's going to be, in 11, there's going to be a false prophet specifically associated with the Antichrist. And who is the Antichrist? He is a false, he's an impersonator of the true Christ. He is a false version, a counterfeit of the true Christ. So does it make sense that he would have a false prophet? Well, you say on the face of it, okay, maybe false prophet, that's kind of interesting. Listen to what Malachi 3 says. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Does that remind you of anybody? John the Baptist. The John the Baptizer, right? This is Old Testament, last book of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. Now, John the Baptist, the concept of John the Baptist is introduced here. He has, he's not on the scene yet because you have, you, between the two testaments, between Malachi and Matthew, you have about 400 plus years. So John the Baptist doesn't come until the book of Matthew. Okay, so 400 plus years later. But the introduction, the concept of a messenger that is coming who was heralding the true Messiah was here back in the Old Testament in Matthew. Now, watch this. Almost the last verse, get this, almost the last verse of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, 5. What does it say? Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Did you get that? So in the Old Testament, almost the last verse, 
Malachi prophesies, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day or great and dreadful day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a time of God's wrath and it's connected to the Messiah's coming. So what do Jewish people hold to in terms of a tradition when they celebrate Passover? You know, they have what's called the Passover Seder meal. Stay with me. So at the time of Passover, which will be coming in a few months, Passover is the oldest continuously celebrated holiday on earth, commemorating the Exodus. And there are prescribed things on the Passover table for Jewish people. And I want to point your attention to this cup right here. This cup is a special cup that's on the Passover table at every Jewish household for thousands of years. It's called the cup of Elijah. And do you know that at the Passover meal, they set up a place setting for everybody who's going to be attending the meal and an extra place setting, usually at the end of the table, for one individual who's not seated in the chair. Elijah. And there's a cup there for him, and it's called the cup of Elijah. And after four cups of wine are, are taken during the Passover Seder meal, there is a, the fifth cup is connected to the cup of Elijah. And it's sitting there at the table at a place setting all by itself with no one in front of it. And at a prescribed time, usually one of the children will go to the front door of the house, still today, open the door, look both ways, and you know who the child is looking for? Elijah. And it's based on this verse. It's based on the verse in Malachi. Behold, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's connected to the idea that Elijah will be the forerunner or the herald of the coming Messiah when he comes. Now, in Matthew chapter 11, and I will wrap up super quick, but I want you to get this. In the context of John the Baptist, Jesus says this, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Verse 14 of Matthew 11. Jesus says this to those Jewish people who are listening. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. And you know what he, Jesus is saying? If you'll receive the message of John the Baptist, what is his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get your heart ready. The king is here. John the Baptist was a forerunner, right, or a herald of Jesus Christ. So, so Jesus is saying about John, he says to the people, he says, if you'll receive John's message of, to repent of your sin, and Jesus is saying, and if you'll embrace me, if you receive me and John's message of repentance, then John is Elijah, which was to come. In other words, what Jesus is saying to the people there, if you'll accept the message of John the Baptist, if you will accept him as forerunner to the Messiah, and if you'll accept me as your Messiah, then John is es essentially fulfilling the prophecy that was made earlier about Elijah. This is an amazing verse, ladies and gentlemen, so crucial. So then one last one. So go to Revelation chapter 11. Okay. So folks, we're told in the Bible that the prophet, that, that two witnesses will appear. And when will they appear? In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, it tells us, it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. How long is that period of time? Three, three and a half years. So folks, when these two witnesses come on the scene, these are good witnesses. They're going to be on the scene from the midpoint of that seven year period shortly after that apostasy is taking place, until the end of the 70th week. These two witnesses, and what, is it, what does it say? It says, these witnesses, it says, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth 
and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Does it mean that fire shooting out of their mouths when they talk? No. It means that when they're pronouncing something or judgment, fire descends to destroy the one that they're pronouncing judgment upon. Do you know anyone historically that called fire down from heaven? Ah, Elijah did when he was clashing with the prophets of Baal and fire came down from heaven. They also have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Anybody have some influence over rain? Elijah. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Anybody come to mind? Moses. Moses. This is why many scholars, and I be included in them, believe that the two witnesses of Revelation that are, listen, the herald, the heralds of the coming king, the heralds, the forerunners of Jesus Christ. They start at the midpoint. They're two, two witnesses. They can call fire down out of heaven. They can, they can uh, hit enemies with plagues. So this is Moses and Elijah. So in fulfillment, listen, in fulfillment of the text, I will send you the prophet Elijah back in Malachi. I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So will Elijah be on the earth before the great and terrible day of the Lord? Yep. Yes, because Elijah and Moses will be here at the midpoint and their ministry on earth will run the full three and a half years, the last three and a half years, and they will be here on the earth before Jesus Christ comes back to, to judge and then to rule and reign. So Elijah will be here. However, what does the Bible also tell us about the false prophet who arises? The false prophet that arises in the book of Revelation in connection to the Antichrist will call down fire from heaven. Do you get it, folks? The Antichrist, who is a counterfeit Messiah, who is trying to deceive in particular the Jews of Israel when he signs a covenant or confirms a covenant with them at the beginning of the 70th week. And he is, he, he is trying to get them to apostatize until he finally goes in at the midpoint and he takes over and he says, bow down and worship me. But you know what's happening during that time? He has a false prophet. And you know what the false prophet is doing in Israel? Calling down fire from heaven. And why do you think Satan has a false prophet working with his antichrist to call down fire from heaven? Because Jews still to this day celebrate Passover at the Seder with a cup for Elijah and they go to the door and look to see if he's coming. Every Jewish person in the world who celebrates Passover knows that Elijah is the herald of the coming Messiah. So how incredibly diabolical that Satan, when the Antichrist is on the earth, has a counterfeit prophet that is saying, worship the Antichrist. When he puts up his image at the temple and he talks to the Jews and he says, bow down and worship, he's been calling fire down from heaven. And the Jews, those who only look at the Old Testament, and most Jewish, Jewish people today only look at the Old Testament, they know the book of Malachi and they know the text that says, Behold, I will send you Elijah before the Messiah comes. So it is only natural that a counterfeit Messiah and a counterfeit false prophet are doing counterfeit miracles to deceive the very people who are looking for Elijah before Jesus Christ returns. Do you see how utterly diabolical it is and how crucial it is for us to be explaining these things, the warnings are there. Jesus gave the warning in Matthew 24 to his disciples, to a Jewish audience. But Jewish people today, by and large, don't read the New Testament. And therefore, they only have what they read in the Old Testament about the coming of Elijah. And they are looking for one. They are looking for Elijah before what they believe the Messiah will return. And that is exactly what the Antichrist will use when his false prophet arises and calls fire down from heaven. So I hope that this has been helpful for you. I know we've gone long and I apologize for that. I wanted you to get, uh, to get that uh, understanding about what the covenant will be like and that it may not be 
It may not be a covenant that comes on the scene where instantaneously that covenant is made, a temple is constructed, animal sacrifices are, uh, are created at that point. Those animal sacrificial system, that sy system may be taking place prior to the covenant because the focus of the covenant that the Antichrist confirms with Israel is for peace and for safety so that that overwhelming scourge of armies coming, probably an Islamic caliphate, will avoid and bypass Israel but Israel has miscalculated because the Bible says he will break the covenant and he will come in to Jerusalem at the midpoint. So thank you for your time and attention. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the depth and the richness uh, of, of your uh, of the scriptures and the warnings that you have provided. Uh, we do pray for our Jewish brethren uh, we pray that uh, you would reveal yourself to them. Um, in the near, near term, we know eventually, ultimately you will, but there will be a remnant, only a remnant, who, who turn to you. Um, but we do ask that you would give us opportunities um, to, to share these truths with our Jewish friends and neighbors and uh, that we'd be able to share it with other believers as uh, it will impact the entire world. And we thank you um, for who you are. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to be born in the little village of Bethlehem with an ultimate purpose of dying on the cross of Calvary as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We thank you for these dear friends. We pray that you would bless them, that you keep them safe as they travel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.